We still have a few minutes before our service begins, and so until then, we want to let you know what's happening this week at CCC. Our latest edition of The Hub magazine is now available for you. The Hub contains real stories of life transformation of people in our church. It's also a great resource for you to learn more about where God is leading CCC and what's happening in the next two months. And so please pick up your free copy today after service. On Sunday, July 1st, you and your family are invited to In God We Still Trust. It's a family-friendly, patriotic celebration featuring CCC's very own choir and orchestra. And this year, we have two service times to choose from. There's one at 7 and one at 8.30. Then after, you're invited to stay for fireworks. Tickets are also on sale now for a one-night concert by Stephen Curtis Chapman right here at CCC later this fall. Stephen has been a major influence in Christian music for the past 20 years, and we're excited to be hosting him. You can find out more about this concert and how to buy your tickets online. Today is the final day of a special two-week series called On Mission. Over the past week and a half, we've been highlighting the amazing ministry work God is doing through CCC to overlooked places in West Africa. Many of you have participated in the various events throughout the week and helped us prepare 200,000 meals to be shipped out later this summer. Thank you for your generosity and commitment to making a big difference. Service is about to begin. For more info about anything we've mentioned today, be sure to check out cccomaha.info.
on the move. Well, good morning, everyone. So glad that you're here today. And once again, this is the uh, uh, second Sunday where we're celebrating uh, the Great Commission and uh, uh, command that Jesus gave us to go and take the news of the, uh, of the gospel message around the world. And uh, so we have much to celebrate today. We're going to have a great morning together. Before we continue, we're going to have you turn and say hello to your neighbor. So wholeheartedly greet some people around you this morning. Could you do that? Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hey, my name is Seth Hurdle. I'm a high school resident here at CCC, and I just want to let you guys know about a little something that's going to be happening next week. Um, as you all know, it's on mission week here, um, and your very own high school and middle school students are going to be heading out onto their mission trips next week. The high school ministry is going to Miami, and the middle school is going to Chicago from the 17th to the 23rd. Um, we're both going to be partnering with Alliance Missionaries down there in both locations, Chicago and Miami. Um, and our hope is that we can relate to the people down there, connect with them, and eventually point them back to Jesus through things like vacation Bible school and sports camps. Um, so on behalf of the student ministry team, I would love to ask for your guys' support. Um, not your financial support but your support through prayer as we get ready to head down to both Chicago and Miami. And now this time, I would love to introduce you to one of our elders, Dave Palladino, who's going to say a quick prayer over us as we get ready to head down there. All right. Thank you, Seth. Um, as, you, as Seth said, and I think it's a great point that, uh, you know, the financial support is nice, but most of these kids are, have an easy time raising that. But re what they really need is your prayers and just... Uh, I'll, I'll pray several prayers, but, you know, they just uh, need a lot of that. And if you could pray for them during the week, you know, prayer just has an amazing power in everybody's lives, and especially these kids, because they're going to be in an interesting place and an amazing place to have an amazing impact for Jesus Christ. So let's bow our heads and pray for them. Dear Heavy Father, just uh, pray over these kids and the staff members as they travel to both Miami and Chicago to uh, spread the gospel. And just really, uh, we're asking for a few things. Uh, one of them is that you play, pray for the logistics, that I know it's really simple, but nobody's baggage gets lost and, you know, nobody gets hurt and that we keep track of all the kids because that's, you know, if you've ever done that, it's a lot of logistics that go into that. We also pray that uh, you just help us plant the seeds uh, to spread the gospel through the basketball camp and uh, the other ministries we're doing there. And just as important that uh, you uh, just guide the CMA missionaries based in those two places that uh, the seeds you, that you plant really sprout well to spread the gospel. We also pray that, you know, we uh, really have the opportunity to follow up on the people we meet there. And then, Father, probably the most important that we pray is that uh, these young men and women that uh, are growing up in our church really strengthen their faith uh, with you. And uh, they have an amazing relationship their entire lives. And when they leave this place to go off to college, that they just really feel passionate about their relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, the last thing that we really pray for is the, that you bind us together as a church and that you really help us appreciate the, the amazing things that have, have happened in the Beyond Belief campaign. And all these things we play, pray in your name. Amen.
sound that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. God reigns. And Lord, we ask that you would give us feet as individuals and as a church that would carry the good news of the gospel around the world. And Lord, may you help us to always make the good news of salvation at the heart of all that we do here. We trust that the offerings of our voices and our hearts has been a sweet thing in your ear today. 
And we ask these things in the strong and wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, once again, welcome to Christ Community Church. I'm Craig Walter, uh, the missions pastor here. And I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward and to uh, receive our morning offering. We just want to always say a huge thank you for your generosity, uh, especially uh, me as the missions pastor. I am so blessed when I see how your generosity, your gifts, change lives literally from, in, in, from, for people in faraway lands from Africa to Asia, South America, and right here in our own city. So thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, as was said up here on stage, uh, today ends our two-week series called uh, On Mission to Overlooked People. Yesterday was amazing, you guys. We had over 550 people from Christ Community Church. Literally, we had a couple people there in their 90s, all the way down to six years old, serving together, and we ended up packaging 207,000 meals that are going to be sent to West Africa. That's right. One of the questions I get often is, so, you know, how are these going to be used? And I'll just give you a glimpse of that. About half of these meals, maybe a little more than half, will go to our hospital in Kuchala, uh, and they will use them with orphans and widows and anybody that they identify that is at risk of malnutrition. Uh, Pastor Moise, who's going to be up here in in a little bit, shared yesterday with the group just how vital these meals are to their mission. Uh, Then the other half will get sent to our relief and development workers in the same country uh, where they actually go into villages and they'll identify children usually uh, that are malnourished and they will put them on a program like for 30 days using these meals to break that cycle of malnutrition in their life. And I want to just again thank you because it's your generosity through our Beyond Belief initiative that paid for yesterday and so thank you guys again for that. Uh, Also, I want to give you a little bit of update, uh, speaking of Beyond Belief, on our Great Commission Fund. If you don't know what the Great Commission Fund is, that's a fund that our alliance, uh, our Christian Missionary Alliance denomination, uses to fund missionaries, over 700 workers around the world. Uh, And Christ Community Church historically gives about $800,000 a year to that. But as part of Beyond Belief, we said we're going to increase by 25%. And we're going to reach a million dollars for the, each year for the next couple of years. And I just want to let you know that after five months this year, we are well on track for that. So again, thank you for your amazing generosity. Hey, you should have been handed one of these prayer guides when you walked in this morning. Uh, maybe you got it last week, but if you don't have one of these, grab one on the way out. You know, we talk about taking the good news of Jesus to the least reached and overlooked people around the world. But I got news for you guys that doesn't depend on you and I. That depends on the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we need prayer. Our missionaries need you to lift them up in prayer. You can find where our workers are serving around the world. You can uh, find a couple ways to pray for them. I would just encourage you, if not on a daily basis, maybe once a week, pick a missionary and say, I'm going to pray for this missionary today as part of my regular prayer time. We would love for you to do that. Uh, As well, last week we had Becky McCabe here, and one of the things we talked about was launching this clothing drive for her ministry called Hands of Honor. Just want to remind you that we're collecting uh, those clothes. If you didn't get one of those cards that tell you what what we're after, you can pick one of those up on the way out as well, Uh, but we'll be collecting through the entire month of June. Uh, Also, I was just, Joe Jensen, one of our guys on staff who runs our residency program, just snagged me and said, hey, could you throw in kind of an urgent announcement? Uh, You might know that we have just launched our second year of our residency program. Uh, We've got, I think, 11 or so new residents that that landed here just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, But we are still in urgent need of two homes. Uh, Part of the residency program is our residents get to live with you guys to help reduce their costs. And we have two married couples uh, who we are desperately in need of a home that, that could take in a married couple If you're interested, Joe Jensen is going to be out at our info center in the main atrium today, and you can chat with him. Well, in a few moments, we are going to hear from our special guests uh, for our morning message. I want to let you know that our content, again, uh, if you are online today, is very sensitive. So we are not going to be broadcasting this service online, but we have a great message for you uh, with one of the vice presidents from our denomination, Tim Crouch. Uh, So I will send you off to Tim Crouch, and let me pray for our morning message. Lord, thank you for uh, just our workers that uh, that are around the world. Thank you especially for our friends from West Africa. 
uh, that have been here this week. We are super blessed to get to hear from a couple of them this morning and, and find out and hear about uh, the amazing work that you are doing through them with the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would just bless them in the next few minutes. In Christ's name, amen. amen. <clears throat> when I take a realistic view of my own life, I'm grotesquely wealthy, and I know it. And I only know it mostly because I've seen grotesque poverty. I am not okay with that. There's something in me that stirs, that says, I can't have been given all this for me. <laughs> And if I can take a small amount of what I have, which is a gift anyway, and give it away in my time, in my abilities, in my finances, then I, I have to. Our church has had really a long standing relationship with the ministry happening in West Africa. Just across the entire church, we've developed a heart and a passion for the Alliance work in this part of the world. Because we're here in America, we feel like people just have access to the gospel. And when you take somebody to a, a village that's out in the middle of nowhere and they realize these people have no opportunity to hear the name of Jesus, much less understand what Jesus did for them, it's just amazing to see that transformation. They see their animals as some of their most important possessions. We eliminate the parasitic load, which in that region is tremendous. If they have one sheep or one goat, that is money in their bank. And without that, there's no food, they can't sell it, they can't get basic needs met. We usually bring over a, a pour-on product. It's a product that you can just squirt on their backs. You just don't have to get so close to those horns, you know. It really looks like you're a clown in a rodeo sometimes. You're just dodging crazy animals and you're running around with this squirter and you're just trying to get everything squirted and marked. Some of the facilities over there are, I mean, lacking is generous. And you know, we did 12,000 animals in four days, which is just an insane amount. But the need was there and, and we were ready. One of the village leaders, I think he was the chief, he said, why would you come all this way to take care of our animals? And the simple answer was, we're doing this because we want to show the love of Jesus. He said, well, the love of Jesus is welcome here. If we go into an area, two people maybe would say they would know Jesus. It was evil and dark, and you could sense it when you walked in the village. And four years later, walk into that village, and that's not the case anymore. And there's a little mud church over there. And you're like, oh my word, this, this is changing things. I mean, I helped with that. I did it in a really goofy way by pouring stuff on cattle, but I really did help in that body of believers. Those souls are not just numbers. They're not just over there. They're me. I am mandated to give them the good news in whatever form. And if bringing them the good news is taking worms out of their cattle, then that's the good news that I will bring them. Uh, today, I want to share with you a message uh, that has a very interesting title. I want to talk about being peculiar people. Uh, and you will see, I, I hope you will see as we move along, that peculiar, though it's a word today that we don't use very much, seems like a negative word, nobody wants to be called peculiar, that there might be some positive reasons for us to be called peculiar. Now, I'm going to use this title, Peculiar People, today uh, because of an old translation from this scripture, 1 Peter chapter 2, and that is the main text that we're going to look at tonight. Uh, and I can remember reading this scripture when I was a little boy, and it said right in there, you 
are a peculiar people. It's worth noting to whom Peter wrote this letter. First Peter is a letter. It's the first of two letters that we have from Peter in the New Testament. And when, when Peter wrote this letter, he was writing to believers in Jesus that grew up Jewish like he did. They were Jewish background believers in Jesus, the Messiah, and now they were living scattered around the Roman Empire. It's to those kinds of people that Peter was writing this letter. Now they live around the Roman Empire. They're living in cities where their neighbors are carousers and uh, political people and the believers in other gods uh, all kinds of things that they'd never experienced in their life. They surely didn't feel at home in the places they found themselves. But it's worth noting that that's his audience for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is I, I want you to see as we read this scripture this morning that these are people that felt lost where God had placed them. But Peter has a good word for them. That God has you there on purpose. He has you there with a purpose. And we'll see how that speaks to us about the purpose God has for us, where he places us or where he sends us. The second reason that it's important to note who these readers were uh, is that it's worth understanding that they knew the Old Testament very well. Because Peter, in his writing to them, uh, quotes from or alludes to a number of places in the Old Testament that maybe you and I won't catch at first read through this passage, but I think his readers surely did. So we're going to read right now from 1 Peter chapter two. Uh, the verses I'm going to read are four through 12, verses four through 12. Why don't you follow as I read? Peter writes, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your good deeds and glorify God in the day he visits us. This is a passage, I believe, that really unfolds what it means to be people of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where God is the king. So the kingdom of God is where God reigns. We follow him, and the fruit that he wants results from that. God reigns, we follow him, and the fruit that he would like to see will be born. That's what the kingdom is. And that's true now, that's true in the hereafter, that's true in one church, that's true in the large church, that's true in individual lives. The real question of the kingdom is, are we people living for the kingdom? 
And by unpacking this scripture today, one of the things that I want to say to you is that I think that living for God's kingdom, while it's God's intention for all of us as believers, living for God's kingdom is very different than what might be the life of the average Christian today. Now, the kingdom has its roots in many Old Testament scriptures, and I think Peter's readers understood those Old Testament scriptures. So we want to take a look at them today, and I really want to share with you three things that we see in this passage uh, about what it means to live lives for the kingdom. For those who would choose to walk in step with God and live kingdom lives, not just average Christian lives, there is in this passage a provision for us, there's a purpose for us, and there's a promise That's exciting as we get to the end of the passage. So let's take a look at those today, beginning with the provision. And the provision, as I want to say it, is a precious identity and intimacy with Christ. Did you notice how many times the word precious was used in this scripture? Over and over again, we read that word precious. Most of the times the word precious is used, it's used in reference to Jesus. He's the living stone. He's the cornerstone. He's the precious cornerstone. Over and over again, uh, our remembrance of Jesus in this passage is, is that he is precious. But that phrase that was translated in the old King James Bible, a, a peculiar people, is the one that I really want to draw your attention to in verse 9. The people of God in verse 9, and we'll unpack this, are called a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Look at this phrase, God's special possession. God's special possession. That's the phrase that was translated, a peculiar people. You see, peculiar is a word that simply means special or unique uh, or different. And what the author here is saying, what Peter is saying, is that you are God's special possession, especially chosen for him alone. Now, I think that when Peter's readers read this particular phrase, they immediately remembered their Old Testament scriptures. I want to share a couple of those with you today. One of them is Exodus chapter 19. I think in Exodus chapter 19, it would be unmistakable uh, that this pops into their minds as they read Peter's words. Here's what's written there, beginning in verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried the... Uh, how I carried you out on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Those words in Exodus 19, verse 5, my treasured possession, are pretty much the same words that Peter is using when he writes Uh, to his readers, that you are God's special possession. And why is this important? Well, we want to see that today. Let me take you to one other scripture that will shed some light on that. It's Isaiah chapter 43. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, we read, But now, this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are my own. You are people that I formed for myself that you may proclaim my praise. What's the motivation that keeps us living differently? What is it that will sustain our intentionality about being in step with God in the reaching of the peoples of the world? What this scripture tells us is that all of that flows out of love for Christ and his love for us. And this is the point of this provision. Our intimacy, our identity in Christ, uh, our closeness with Him becomes the wellspring that overflows into our response of being in step with Him in the things that He wants to do in the world. And as we get into the purpose and the promise, we're going to see there are things that God wants to do in this world. He's the missionary. (laughs) He's on the move. He's on mission in this world. And he's not asking us to go out and do something for him. He's asking us to come do something with him. And our response flows 
out of our love for him who made himself known to us. Let me tell you about a friend of mine. His name is Victor. Victor was one of my very first friends that I met when I moved to Russia back in 1995. Our family went there. He lived his life out of his love for Jesus. If you met Victor on the bus, you were going to hear about Jesus. He was joyful, he was in love with Jesus, and he couldn't stop talking about him. So one day he said to me, why don't you come over to my house? Uh, you know, I used to be a, uh, an artist. Uh, that's what I did for a living. I've got some paintings, I'll show you my paintings. And he pulled them out and he started showing me these, these paintings and they were horrible. I mean, they weren't poor paintings. They were, they were dark. They were depressing. They were scary, <laughs> frightening images. Uh, I couldn't believe that my bubbly friend in love with Jesus painted these things. How is it that the, that kind of art came out of this guy? Well, of course, it occurred to me then, it's because he met Jesus. Jesus had changed his life so radically, that explained why he was so in love with him, and that had everything to do with how Victor served Jesus. You see, we're not just to be receivers uh, of the good news, but people who live it out and share it with others. And that, that will always wear thin if it doesn't flow out of intimacy with Christ, out of love for him who saved us. If we are in touch with the miracle that it is that we had access to the gospel, it becomes the wellspring of motivation to give access to others. Victor exemplified that. So the second thing that I want to talk about is the purpose then that God gives us. And I want to say this, you saw the words in the passage, it's a priestly purpose. We might struggle to understand what that means, but again, we're helped here by Peter's readers. You see, they were Jewish people. They grew up back in the Holy Land. They lived in Israel and Judah. Some of them were from Jerusalem. They'd been to the temple. These were people that knew a thing or two about priests. So when Peter says to them in verse nine again, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Earlier in the passage, when we read that you like living stones are being built into a spiritual house, uh, not a stone temple, but a, a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. So again, not animal sacrifices, but now spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. What does it mean to have that kind of priestly role in God's kingdom today? What is this purpose all about? Well, let's go back to those same two scriptures that we looked at before, Exodus chapter 19, and Isaiah 43. In Exodus 19, we read that out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Listen to the very next verse, verse six. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is exactly where Peter's words come from. So God says, look, you're my treasured possession. I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw you to myself <laughs> so that you will become this kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And we read in Isaiah 43 that I have summoned you by name, you are mine, you are the people I formed for myself that you may proclaim my praise. You see that inward motion that then turns around and goes outward. That's the role of a priest. You see, the readers knew something about priests they, they understood that priests are people, I want you to catch this, priests are people that bring God before others and bring those others before God. That's what priests do. For the people who would live for the kingdom of God, this ought to characterize our lives, that we understand that we are not in the neighborhood where God placed us by mistake. We are not in the circles uh, where we walk. We don't have the colleagues that we have at work uh, by accident, but by design, in order that we may be the priests in their lives, bringing them before God, bringing God before them. 
But I want to tell you that as Peter's readers read this passage, I'm sure that they understood it more broadly than that. And thankfully for them, as they lived amongst foreigners and strangers, maybe even in places where they didn't speak the local language yet, they understood that God's intention was that his people would be priests, not only for the neighbors, but for the nations. Let me tell you why. Let's look at another scripture. This is Isaiah chapter 56. In Isaiah chapter 56, words are written that I think would have come to their minds as they read Peter's. So let me read them to you. It says this, let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and all who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. The God of Israel, the King of Israel, is also the God and King of the nations. And his desire was that the people of Israel would have a priestly ministry, not only to their neighbors, uh, but to the nations. And when Peter's readers read about what it means to be living stones built up into a spiritual house, where the sacrifices that are offered are not animals, but are some kind of spiritual sacrifice that's acceptable to God, I think they had an aha moment. I think they remembered Isaiah 56, and they understood God's heart is for the nations as well as for our neighbors. And this is God's heart for those that would choose to live for his kingdom today. God's desire is that we would be the peculiar ones who actually care as much about the nations as we do about our neighbors. That we would play our priestly role, that we would offer sacrifices from our own lives for the benefit not only of those near, but of those far. You see, God's heart is for all the peoples of the world. And his intention has always been to use those first gathered to himself in order to gather still others. This is the priestly purpose that God has for us. And I want to tell you that this is what ought to drive us as people of the kingdom. And, and my prayer is that this is what will drive us in your church. This is what will drive us in our alliance churches across this country that will be people in step with the one who is not only God of the neighbors, but God of the nations, whose heart is to gather still more. This is what drives our alliance ministry. I, I wanna take just a moment to talk to you about the vision uh, of our international ministries uh, in our family of alliance churches here in the U.S., our vision really revolves around these seven words, gospel access for and from all peoples. And let me unpack that for you very briefly. If there are people of the world who in their own culture or society lack opportunity to hear the gospel, they lack access to the good news of Jesus, that access can only come to them from one place, from outside their culture or society. It's got to come from outside. It's got to come into them by someone who brings it. And so what does that look like? Well, that looks like networks of churches like our family in the United States or, or maybe not only in the United States but in other places. But it looks like some networks of churches saying, hey, we will not only reach our own but we want to reach out to those unlike ourselves in places where there's a disparity of access to the gospel. Where people don't have the access that we've experienced, we wanna reach out to them. 
That's how gospel access is created. But I believe that God not, God not only wants us to grant gospel access to some people that haven't heard of him yet, but God's desire is that the opportunity to hear Jesus in that culture will remain. It will live. It will be upheld generation after generation. That's God's desire, is that gospel access will not only be granted, but as new networks of churches get planted in that culture or society, that they will uphold the gospel for their own, and guess what? So that they will become priests for still others that need to hear. Let me briefly tell you a story about the Bunong people of Cambodia. Uh, the Bunong people of Cambodia live in the eastern portion of Cambodia in the Mondulkiri province on the border with Vietnam. In fact, the people right across the border in Vietnam are their cousins. Uh, they are the Monong people of Vietnam. The Monong people of Vietnam received the gospel back in the 1960s from missionaries that served in that part of Vietnam. And the people, the Bunong people in Mondulkiri province of Cambodia heard about that. And they said, hey, why don't you send some of those missionaries over here so that we also could hear this news about Jesus? Well, the war got worse and uh, limitations are what they are. And that never happened. In the 1960s nor the 1970s, nobody made it across to share the gospel with the Bonong people, even though they had asked for it. Finally, it was in the 1980s, as God does what God does, he, he stirs the nations, wars were going on, the Pol Pot regime had, had risen and fallen, and during that very difficult period of time, uh, Bonong people were going over to Vietnam to stay away from the difficulty to run away as refugees, and they had the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus. Some of them believed, and then eventually they came back. And today in that province, the Bonong people have amongst them about 28 churches. This picture here is a picture of the dedication of the Bonong New Testament that was translated. It was dedicated just last year, just a year ago. Now, here's what I really want you to know about this story. The Bunong people have looked to the north where another tribe lives that doesn't know Jesus. They are called the Timon people. The Timon live to the north of the Bunong. They don't know about Jesus. In December of last year, less than six months ago, those 28 Bunong churches commissioned their first missionary <laughs> to go to the Timon people and share the good news of Jesus with them. Do you see it? This is God's desire, and this is how the Great Commission will be fulfilled. He's given us a provision. He's given us a clear purpose, but there's a very special promise that shows up in the end of this passage, and the promise is that God will himself show up in order to bring out people for himself. Would you look at this with me? At the very end of verse 12, did you note verse 12 that says, live such godly lives amongst the pagans. There's another word we don't like to use very much today. Live such godly lives amongst those around you that don't know God at all. Live such godly lives amongst them that even though they think you're nuts, even though they think you're peculiar, even though they might accuse you of doing wrong, at the end of the day, they will see your good works and they will glorify God. That's a great description of what it means to live as people of the kingdom. But look at the, at the phrase that comes at the very tail end. They will give glory to God when? On the day he visits us. What in the world does that mean? They'll give glory to God on the day he visits us. Well, we need to understand what that means. I find it very interesting. First of all, we know Philippians chapter two, and it also occurs here in Romans chapter 14. Uh, we know that scripture that says, um, the day will come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's from 
Philippians chapter 2. In Romans, we're told, number one, that this is a quote from Isaiah 45, and that in Isaiah 45, it's about the judgment day. For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. As surely as I live, it's written, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. Is this what Peter was talking about? Is this the day what God visits? Well, perhaps. If you read all of 1 Peter, there, there are references to the end that's coming. But this is a sad answer. <laughs> If this is the day when people will give glory to God, the problem with it is it's too late. They will recognize and give glory to God on that day, but it's too late for them to be saved. That's a sad answer to what this means. But there is a happy answer. Let me take you on a little bit of a journey in the New Testament. I want to talk to you about Acts chapter 15. Again, back to our history. In Acts chapter 15, what was going on was this. The gospel had begun to be shared with Gentiles, and they were believing in Jesus and following him. Do you remember the story in Acts chapter 10? Peter himself shares the good news with Cornelius, this Roman centurion. And Cornelius and his whole family and everybody else involved in his household, they decide to follow Jesus. And so people, the Jewish people in the churches that existed to that point, started scratching their heads and saying, what's this? Can Gentiles also become believers in Jesus? So they pulled together a council. (laughs) They had a church meeting. They brought together leaders of the churches from different places. They met in Jerusalem, and we read about that in Acts chapter 15. And we don't read the story of Cornelius again, but I I believe that Peter probably told that story at the council in Acts chapter 15 because verse 14 says this, James, the brother of Jesus, stood up and said, Peter has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. Guess what? That word visited is the exact same word Peter uses in his letter on the day that God visits us. It's actually a verb form of the word for bishop. Uh, The Greek word for bishop is episcop. And there's the root of episcop is in this word visit. What it literally means is this. God will show up with authority. Now, of course, God will show up with authority on Judgment Day, but here's this wonderful glimpse into how the kingdom that exists on the other side of Judgment Day leaks backwards into our present day because God's on the move, raising up a people for himself. So when Peter told that story of Cornelius, he said, you know what? God showed up. I was just sharing the good news with Cornelius because he asked for it. Peter was reluctant, but he saw the Holy Spirit come. He saw hearts melt. He saw a response to the gospel. James sums it up this way. God visited with authority. God showed up in power to take out from the Gentiles a people for his name. This is the day of visitation. This is the day God visits us that has good news attached to it. Today, while knees can still bow to him and tongues confess that he's Lord before it's too late for them to be saved, God wants to show up and draw people out for himself. And he will do it. He does it when peculiar people of the kingdom live their lives this way. They let their love for Jesus flow. The question for us today is, are we peculiar people? Will we be peculiar people? Do we want to be people of the kingdom? People who choose not to live out average Christian lives defined by the lowest common denominator of what we find in church. But people who understand, wow, our calling is to live for his kingdom, is to build our lives around that. 
It won't happen if it doesn't begin with love. I began by thanking those of you that partner in this work as we do it together across our family of churches uh, that pray, that go, that participate, that give to the Great Commission Fund of the Alliance. Uh, I want to end by not only thanking you, but for asking, by asking those of you that haven't joined in, why not? Let's do it. Let's be people of his kingdom. He will call. How will we respond? I want to close in prayer, asking you to think about that question. What is it that God's calling us to do? We've seen that he's got a purpose. We know that it's a priestly purpose. Where is it going to be lived out and how in your life? Let God speak to you and respond to him, I hope, out of love and readiness. Thank you for joining us today online. Hopefully you've had a fuller picture of all that God is doing through CCC and the Christian and Missionary Alliance to bring the gospel to the least reached places of the world. Next week, we're kicking off a brand new seven-week sermon series. It's through the book of Titus. And we hope you'll tune in to watch. If you're in the Omaha area, we'd love for you to consider joining us here in person. Have a great week and God bless.